Chemistry 111, practice exam three. First question, which of the following describes Dalton's law? A, only one variable can be changed from an initial state to a final state for a gas. In B, the total pressure of a gas is the sum of the partial pressures of each gas in the mixture. This is in fact Dalton's law of partial pressures because we know that Dalton's law is that the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the first gas plus the pressure of the second gas plus the pressure of the third gas, so on and so forth. The next one says um, the pressure of a gas is proportional to its volume. This is not Dalton's law of partial pressures. It's in fact a uh, misstatement on Boyle's law, which is that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. And then finally, D says the temperature of a gas is proportional to its volume. And this is, in fact, Charles' law. So that would be Charles, Charles' law. Question two, which of the following statements is consistent with Boyle's law concerning an ideal gas? Well, we know that Boyle's law is that pressure times volume is proportional to some constant. Or we could rewrite that as pressure is inversely proportional to volume. And then sometimes we'll write this formula as P1 times V1 is equal to P2V2, like that. If we look at A, at constant pressure and volume, a plot of temperature versus moles is linear. That is not true. It's not Boyle's law. Um, for B, at constant temperature and pressure, a plot of moles versus volume is linear. No, that's Avogadro's law. In C, at constant temperature and moles, a plot of volume versus pressure is linear. This is in fact not true. Now if we back up to C and we look at a plot of volume versus pressure and it says that it's linear in C, that is in fact not true because you see that when you plot um, pressure versus volume you get this inverse relationship that is nonlinear. Whereas if we plot um, pressure versus the inverse of the volume, you can see that we get a linear graph like this. And so the correct answer is E, at constant temperature and number of moles, a plot of pressure versus the inverse of volume is linear. Question three, what's going to happen to the height of the mercury? A column in the manometer shown below if the stopcock is open, given that the atmospheric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury. Well, we know that if we're in a vacuum, that the pressure that's actually in this headspace here, the pressure is equal to zero millimeters of mercury. So there's no pressure whatsoever. And once we open that stopcock, once we turn it in this direction, it's going to have the force of the atmospheric pressure, which is equal to um, 755 millimeters of mercury, which is, of course, is greater than zero. And so that's going to push the column of mercury down like that. So the height of that column of mercury in the manometer is going to decrease. Question number four deals with the kinetic molecular theory of gases. Which of the, these properties is or are characteristic of gases? Relatively large distances between molecules. Yes, that is a, a characteristic of gases. High compressibility. Absolutely. We know that we can't compress um, solids or liquids very effectively. However, we can compress gases because we know that they are largely um, empty space. And then finally, Formation of homogeneous mixtures of gases is uh, possible um, regardless of the nature of what those gases are, and we know that that is true as well. And so the correct answer is going to be all of the above, A, B, and C. The next question, number five, which of the following is not an example of a compound that exists as a gas at room temperature? We have methane, which is CH4. Next, we have ammonia, NH3. After that, we have calcium chloride, CaCl2. After that, we have nitrogen dioxide, so NO2. And then lastly, we have sulfur dioxide. Well, you notice that um, compounds A, B, D, and E, those are all covalent compounds, right? They're all made out of non-metals, but only one of these is an ionic compound, and that is calcium chloride. It is made out of a metal, calcium, and non-metal, chlorine. And so calcium chloride is actually a solid at room temperature. And so it is not a gas at room temperature. And all of the other compounds, methane, ammonia, nitrogen dioxide, and sulfur dioxide are all gases 
at room temperature. And so we could put the G like this next to them to denote that they are all gases, and we can put an S by our calcium chloride. Question six, which of these gases will have the greatest density at the same specified temperature and pressure? Well, we know that at STP, or standard temperature and pressure, when temperature is equal to 273 Kelvin, or zero degrees Celsius, and um, the pressure is equal to one atmosphere, or 760 millimeters of mercury, we know that um, when N is equal to one mole, so when we, when we have one mole of a gas, that the volume of that gas is going to be 22.414 liters. Then we can use the equation density is equal to mass over volume, and if we know that one mole of any of these five gases is going to take up 22.414 liters, all we have to do is plug into the numerator, we have to just plug in the molar mass of all of these gases. So if we look at the molar mass of all of these gases, and I've already gone ahead and calculated them, so for hydrogen it's 2.016, grams per mole. Um, for carbon tetrafluoride, it's 88.00 grams per mole. For CCLF3, it's 104.46 grams per mole. The next one, C2H6, which is ethane, is 30.07 grams per mole. And carbon dioxide is 44.01 grams per mole. Now that we have all those molar masses, we know that the heaviest one out of all of these for one mole, at least, is CCLF3. Okay, so C is gonna be our answer because when we put that number as the mass of one mole of a gas, one mole of that gas, um, which is gonna take up 22.414 liters, this gas, CCLF3, is gonna have the highest molar mass. And so we don't even have to do a calculation. This is just a qualitative problem evaluate the molar masses of the five gases, and whichever one is the heaviest, that's gonna be your final answer. That's gonna have be the one that has the greatest density. Now a second option for solving this problem is based off of a formula that we saw in chapter five, which is that if we manipulate the ideal gas equation, we determine that density is equal to pressure times molar mass divided by R, the gas constant, times temperature. And so since we are at um, constant pressure and constant temperature, and since the gas constant is obviously a constant, you can see that density is directly proportional to molar mass. So whichever one of these gases has the highest molar mass, which again is CCLF3, this one is going to have the highest density. Seven. Samples of the following volatile liquids are opened simultaneously at one end of a room. If you're standing on the opposite end of this room, which species would you smell first? Assuming that your nose is equally sensitive to all species. Now you notice that for all five of these volatile compounds, camphor, ethyl acetate, naphthalene, and diethyl ether, and pentane thiol, you notice that for each one of them, it includes their molar masses. So the speed of the gas, the speed that the gas is gonna travel through the room, must have something to do with the molar mass. And in fact, that is true because if we calculate the root mean square speed, so root mean square speed of a gas, it's equal to the square root of three times the gas constant times temperature divided by the molar mass. So what does that tell you? It tells you that root mean square speed or the the speed the gas is gonna travel through the air is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. And so whichever one of these gases is the lightest gas is gonna travel the fast. Whichever one is the heaviest is gonna travel the slowest. And the lightest gas here is the diethyl ether vapor that is going through the air. So since it's the lightest, it's gonna travel the fastest. And again, that is based on this equation right here. Root mean square speed of a gas is equal to the square root of 3RT divided by the molar mass M. Question eight, a 250 milliliter flask contains 3.4 grams of neon gas at 45 degrees Celsius. Calculate the pressure of the neon uh, gas inside the flask. Well, first let's start by writing down what we have. We know we have a volume of 250 milliliters. We know that there are a thousand milliliters in one liter, so we could say that this is equal to 0 0.25 liters so we have our volume 
we have 3.4 grams of neon gas. I'm gonna convert that into the number of moles of neon gas. And we know that number of moles is equal to mass divided by molar mass. So we have 3.4 grams of our neon. I go over to my periodic table and I see that the molar mass of neon is 20.18 grams per mole. You can see that moles, or sorry, grams are gonna cancel out and we're left over with the number of moles of neon and I get 0 0.17 moles of neon. And then we have our temperature, which is 45 degrees Celsius. We add 273 to that to determine that the temperature in Kelvin is 318 Kelvin. So what do we have? We've got our volume, we've got our number of moles, and we have our temperature. Now we can use the ideal gas equation, which is PV is equal to NRT to solve for P. And we see that P is gonna be equal to NRT divided by V. Now we can simply plug in the numbers. We have the number of moles of our, uh, of our neon gas, which is 0.17 moles. We know the gas constant, which is 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. There we go. We know our temperature, which is 318 Kelvin, like that. And then we have our volume, which was 0 0.25 liters. Let's check our units. Liters should cancel, moles should cancel, temperature units of Kelvin should cancel, and we're left over with atmospheres. And when you put all of that into your calculator, you find that the pressure is 18, 18 atmospheres, which is D. Question nine, what is the molar mass of Freon 11 gas? If its density is 6.13 grams per liter at standard temperature and pressure, we know that at standard temperature and pressure, that one mole, one mole of a gas is gonna take up 22.414 liters like that. And we can use this conversion factor to help us determine the molar mass of a gas because we know that density is equal to mass over volume. We can actually solve for the molar mass if we multiply the density multiplied by the volume of one mole of the gas. Okay, so we're gonna determine the molar mass by saying the density, which is 6.13 grams per liter, and then we're gonna multiply that by the volume of one mole of the gas. So we have 22.414 liters in one mole of the gas, and look at this we end up canceling our liters and our units are gonna be grams per mole, which is our molar mass. And so we get that our molar mass is equal to 137 grams in one mole. And so the answer is A. Question 10, calculate the density in grams per liter of nitrogen gas at 35 degrees Celsius and 0 0.98 atmospheres of pressure. First thing I'll do is calculate the temperature in Kelvin, so I add 273 to 35, and I get that my temperature is 308 Kelvin. And how do we calculate density having you know the temperature and the pressure of a gas? Well, we're gonna use a couple of formulas here. First of all, we know that density is equal to mass over volume, and we also know that molar mass is equal to the mass of something divided by the number of moles of something like that. And we can rearrange that formula to give the number of moles, N is equal to mass divided by molar mass. Now we're gonna take this equation and we're gonna plug it into the ideal gas equation, which is PV is equal to NRT. And so when I substitute PV and I replace N, with little m over big M, so little m over big M, mass over molar mass times RT, you can see that now I can rearrange this formula to have little m, my mass, over volume being equal to pressure times molar mass divided by RT. Now what is little m, or sorry, little m over V? Little m over V is in fact density. And so now we have this equation that density is equal to pressure times molar mass divided by RT. And we're gonna use that equation to solve for the density of our nitrogen gas. So let's go ahead and do that. We know that our density is equal to our pressure, 0 0.98 atmospheres, multiplied by the molar mass of nitrogen gas. I've gone ahead and looked that up already. It's two times 
the molar mass of nitrogen. So it's 28.01 grams per mole. So I'll plug that in, 28.01 grams per mole for my nitrogen. And then I divide that by the gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin, like that. And then I multiply all of that by the temperature in the denominator, 308 Kelvin, like that. And then let's see if our units work out. So atmospheres cancel, um, Kelvins cancel, and um, moles cancel, and we're left over with grams per liter like that. So when we plug all this in our calculator, we get a density which is equal to 1.1 grams per liter. And so the answer is E. Question 11, the gas pressure in an aerosol can is 1.8 atmospheres at 25 degrees Celsius. If the gas is an ideal gas, what pressure would develop in the can if it was heated to 475 degrees Celsius? The first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and convert these temperatures into Kelvin. So I see that my T1, or my initial temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, when I add 273 to that, I get 298 Kelvin. And then it reaches a T2, or a final temperature, of 475 plus 273, which is 748 Kelvin. And I'm also provided with my initial pressure, which is 1.8 atmospheres. Now, I can use these all together in Gay-Lussac's law, which is P1 over T1 is equal to P2 over T2, because pressure and temperature are directly proportional to one another. And I can use these to solve for the final pressure, which is P2. Now, if I rearrange this formula for P2, I get that P2 is equal to P1 times T2 divided by T1. Let's plug in some numbers here. We have 1.8 atmospheres multiplied by our T2, which is 748 Kelvin, divided by our T1, which was 298 Kelvin. Let's double check our units. You see the temperature units cancel out, and we're left over with our P2 being equal to 4.5 atmospheres. We should only have two significant figures here, and so the answer is D, 4.5 atmospheres. Question 12, a small bubble rises from the bottom of a lake where the temperature and pressure are four degrees Celsius and three atmospheres to the water's surface where the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius and the pressure is 0.95 atmospheres. What's the final volume if the initial volume of the bubble was 2.1 milliliters? So we're given our initial volume, our V1 is 2.1 milliliters. The initial pressure and temperature are here as well. The initial temperature, so if I take 273 and I add four to it, I get 277 Kelvin. And my initial pressure, I'll just not change those units, leave it in atmospheres like that. We're also given the final pressure and the final temperature, right? The final temperature, our T2 is equal to 298 Kelvin. And our final pressure, or our P2, is equal to 0 0.95 atmospheres. And so what we're solving for is the final volume, right? Which is our V2. And this is where we can use the combined gas law. And the combined gas law is P1 times V1 over T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over T2, T2. And what are we solving for? We are solving for V2. And so let's rearrange the formula for V2, which is gonna be equal to P1 times V1 times T2 divided by T1 times P2. Then we can simply plug in our numbers, which is 3.0 atmospheres multiplied by our initial volume, which is 2.1 milliliters. Uh, what's next? We have our um, final temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. And then we have our T1 and our P2, so 277 Kelvin and our P2 is 0 0.95 atmospheres, like that, okay. Let's double check our units. You see the atmospheres cancel out, as do 
Kelvin, and we're left over with the volume in milliliters, which we can do. And so our V2, when we plug all this into our calculator, should only have two significant figures, and it is 7.1 milliliters. So V2 is 7.1 milliliters, which is B. Question 13, at what temperature will a sample of nitrogen gas with a volume of 328 milliliters at 15 degrees Celsius and 748 millimeters of mercury occupy a volume of 0.98 liters at a pressure of 642 millimeters of mercury. Assume the amount of nitrogen gas does not change. We are given our initial volume, which is 0.328 liters. We are given our initial temperature, our T1, which is 288 Kelvin. And we're also given our initial pressure. When you convert 748 millimeters of mercury into atmospheres, you divide by 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere, and you end up with 0 0.984 atmospheres. We are given our final volume, our V2, and we're given our final pressure, our P2. I'm going to convert that into atmospheres, and when you do, you get 0 0.845 atmospheres and what are we looking at for we're looking for the temperature the final temperature or t2 and so this is another example where we can use the combined gas law which is p1 times v1 divided by t1 is equal to p2 times v2 divided by t2 and we want to solve this for t2 and so t2 is going to be equal to v2 times t1 times p2 divided by P1 times V1. We're gonna plug in some numbers here. So we have 0 0.898 liters multiplied by our initial temperature, which is 288 Kelvin, multiplied by our final pressure, which is 0 0.845 atmospheres. And then we're gonna divide that by P1, which is 0 0.984 atmospheres, multiplied by V1, and our V1 was 0 0.328 liters. Let's check our units, liters cancel, as do atmospheres, and we should end up with our T2 being equal to 677 Kelvin. Now you notice that all the final answers are given in degrees Celsius, and we know that the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in degrees Celsius plus 273, therefore the temperature in degrees Celsius is gonna be equal to the temperature in Kelvin, subtract 273, and so we're gonna take this temperature and we're gonna subtract 273 from it to determine the temperature in degrees Celsius, and we end up with 404 degrees Celsius as our final answer, which is E. Question 14, the following data describes an initial and final state for an ideal gas. Given that the amount of gas does not change during the process, what is the final volume of the gas? You can see that the units for pressure are millimeters of mercury, and the units for temperature are Celsius, degrees Celsius, so we need to convert those into atmospheres and um, Kelvin, respectively, and I'm gonna do that right here. So for our pressure, our initial pressure, when we take 720 uh, millimeters of mercury, and we know that there are 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere. So we simply divide 720 by 760, and we end up with our initial pressure as being 0 0.947 atmospheres. We do the same thing for 860. We divide that by 760 millimeters of mercury in one atmosphere, and we get a final pressure of 1.13 atmospheres. Then for my temperature, for those to convert to degrees Celsius into Kelvin, we simply add 273. So 25 plus 273 gives you 298 Kelvin as your initial temperature, and 288 Kelvin is the final temperature. And so we are solving for V2. And for this question, we're going to need the um, combined gas law, which is P1 times V1 over T1 is equal to P2 times V2 over T2. And then we are simply going to solve for V2. And so V2 is going to be equal to P1 times V1 times T2 divided by T1 times P2. Let's plug in our numbers. We get our 0 0.947 atmospheres multiplied by our V1, which is 235 
milliliters multiplied by our T2, which is 288 Kelvin. And then in our denominator, we have our T1, which is 298 Kelvin, multiplied by our P2, which is 1.13 atmospheres. We can see that atmospheres cancel, as do Kelvin. We end up with our V2 in milliliters, which is good because all the answers here are in milliliters, and we end up with 190 milliliters as our final volume, and so the answer is C, 190 milliliters. A mixture of three gases has a total pressure of 1,380 millimeters of mercury at 298 Kelvin. The mixture is analyzed and found to contain 1.27 moles of carbon dioxide, 3.04 moles of carbon monoxide, and 1.50 moles of argon. What is the partial pressure of argon? And in order to determine the partial pressure of a gas, like the partial pressure of our argon, it's going to be equal to the mole fraction of argon multiplied by the total pressure. Now we know the total pressure, but we do not have the mole fraction of argon. So we need to determine that first. And we know that mole fraction of argon is going to be equal to the number of moles of argon divided by the total number of moles in the container. Now the number of moles of argon is 1.50 moles of argon. The total number of moles of gases in the container is 1.27 moles plus 3.04 moles plus 1.50 moles. And so when we tally all that up in our denominator, um, we end up with a mole fraction of 0 0.258. And so we can take that mole fraction and plug it into here to determine the partial pressure of our argon. So the partial pressure of our argon is going to be equal to 0 0.258 multiplied by 1,380 millimeters of mercury, and we end up with 356 as the partial pressure of the argon gas in the mixture. Question 16. A 0.271 gram sample of an unknown vapor occupies 294 milliliters at 140 degrees Celsius and 847 millimeters of mercury. The empirical formula is CH2. What's the molecular formula of the compound? Well, the first thing we'll do is we'll determine the number of moles of this gas. And then if we know the number of moles and we know the mass of this gas, we can determine the, the molar mass of the gas and then we can, can compare that molar mass to the mass of the empirical formula. We're given the number of grams of our sample is 0.271. Now we're given the volume, which is equal to 294 milliliters, which is 0 0.294 liters of our gas. We're given our temperature is 140 degrees Celsius. If we add 273 to that, we get that the temperature is 413 Kelvin. Uh, for our pressure, our pressure is going to be equal to 847 millimeters of mercury. We divide that by the conversion factor, 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere. And we get the pressure in atmospheres as being 1.11 atmospheres. And so we can now rearrange the ideal gas law. PV is equal to nRT. And we can solve for N, which is PV divided by R. T. So let's plug in some numbers here. We have our 1.11 atmospheres. We have our volume, which is 0 0.294 liters, divided by our R, which is 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And then we multiply that by the temperature, 413 Kelvin, like that. Let's double check our units. Liters cancel, atmospheres cancel, Kelvin cancel, and we are left over with N, our number of moles. And we get that the number of moles is 0 0.00966 moles. And so now we can use the formula that molar mass, big M, is equal to the mass divided by the number of moles. And our mass is 0 0.271 grams. And our number of moles is 0 0.00966 moles. And we get that the Molar mass of our gas is 28.0, so 28.0 grams 
per mole. Now, if you add up the mass of CH2, it's uh, 12 for the carbon and one for each hydrogen. So you get a molar mass of 14 grams per mole here. Now, how many times would I have to multiply 14 in order to equal 28 grams per mole? And the answer is I'd have to multiply it by two. So I'm gonna take the CH2 and I'm gonna multiply that by two. And when I do, I get C2H4, which must be the formula of my gas. And so that would be E, C2H4, which is ethylene gas. A sample of hydrogen gas was collected over water at 21 degrees Celsius and 685 millimeters of mercury. The volume of the container was 7.80 liters. Calculate the mass of hydrogen gas collected. And it tells us that the vapor pressure of water at that temperature, 21 degrees Celsius, is 18.6 millimeters of mercury. And we know that's important because this total pressure that we're given here, this 685 millimeters of mercury is equal to the pressure of the hydrogen gas plus the pressure of the water vapor, which we're also given. So if we want to calculate the pressure of the gas that we're concerned about, the hydrogen gas, it's going to be equal to the total pressure minus the pressure of that water vapor. And when we plug in our numbers, 685 millimeters of mercury subtract um, 18.6 millimeters of mercury, we get the partial pressure of our hydrogen gas, which is equal to 666 millimeters of mercury. Now I've gone ahead and converted that into atmospheres already by dividing by 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere, and I get 0 0.877 atmospheres. Now we're asked to calculate the mass of hydrogen gas, and that is gonna be related to the number of moles of hydrogen gas, because if I take the number of moles and I multiply it by the molar mass of hydrogen, which is 2.02 grams per mole, that will give me the mass of my hydrogen. And so I need to rearrange the ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT, and I need to solve for N. N is equal to PV divided by RT. I'll plug in my pressure, which is 0 0.877 atmospheres. My volume, 7.80 liters. I know the gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per mole per mole Kelvin, like that. I put in my temperature, 21 degrees Celsius converted into Kelvin. I simply add 273 and I get 294 Kelvin, like that. I can cancel my units of atmosphere and volume and temperature and I end up with the number of moles of my hydrogen gas as being 0 0.283 moles of hydrogen gas. And then again, if I wanna calculate the mass of my hydrogen gas, or the mass of my H2, it's gonna be equal to the number of moles of my H2 multiplied by the molar mass of my hydrogen, which is 0 0.283 moles multiplied by 2.02 grams per mole, like that. You can see that my units of moles cancel out and I'm left over with the mass of hydrogen, which is 0 0.571 grams of hydrogen. And so the answer is E. A sample of mercury two oxide is placed in a five liter evacuated container and heated until it decomposes entirely to mercury, metal, and oxygen gas. The container is then cooled to 25 degrees Celsius. One now finds that the pressure inside the container is 1.73 atmospheres. What mass of mercury two oxide was originally placed in the container? So the first thing we're gonna need is a balanced equation and we're starting it with mercury to oxide as a solid and we heat that and we're decomposing it completely to mercury which is a liquid plus oxygen which is a gas. In order to balance that equation we have two oxygens in the product so we're gonna have two here and then a two here. So now we have a balanced equation. Now we are given the volume of our container. So we have our volume, which is 5.00 liters. And we are also given our temperature. Our temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. We get that by adding 273 to the temperature. And we're also given the pressure, which is 1.73 
atmospheres. Now, if we use the ideal gas law, PV is equal to nRT, and we solve for N, which is PV over RT, what is the N that we're going to be getting? Well, the only gas that we have in the entire reaction is the oxygen gas that's produced because it tells us that the mercury 2 oxide decomposes completely to give us a metal and a gas. So when we determine N, what we're going to actually be determining is the N, we're going to determine the number of moles of oxygen. So let's do that. Let's figure out the number of moles of oxygen. Let's plug in some numbers. We have 1.73 atmospheres multiplied by our volume, which is 5.00 liters divided by our gas constant 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And then we'll multiply that by our temperature, which is 298 Kelvin. Let's check our units. So we have atmospheres canceling, liters canceling, and Kelvin's canceling, and we end up with the number of moles of our oxygen, which is equal to 0 0.354 moles of oxygen. Now, if we have the number of moles of oxygen, we can use our balanced equation to help us determine the mass of mercury 2 oxide. Now, how can we do that? Well, we have the molar mass of mercury 2 oxide, or HgO, which is... 216.59 grams per mole. And now we can just do use dimensional analysis, which we started with our 0 0.354 moles of oxygen. And we know that for every one mole of oxygen that's produced, we consume two moles of HgO, or mercury 2 oxide. And we know that in one mole of HgO, or mercury oxide, we have 216.59 grams of HgO. You can see that our units cancel out. We have moles of oxygen, moles of HgO, and we're left over with grams of HgO. So let's work that math out. And when we do that, we end up with 153 grams of HgO or mercury to oxide. And our answer is B. Number 19, what volume of oxygen at 810 millimeters of mercury pressure is required to completely react with a 4.5 gram sample of carbon at 48 degrees Celsius? Well, we're given a balanced equation here. I'm gonna rewrite it here. So we have two moles of carbon, which is a solid, plus one mole of oxygen gives us two moles of carbon monoxide gas. Now we're starting with 4.50 grams of carbon. And so from that, we can determine the number of moles of carbon. And when we have the number of moles of carbon, we can figure out the number of moles of oxygen from our balanced equation. So let's do that. Using dimensional analysis, we have 4.50 grams of carbon. We know that in one mole of carbon, we go to the periodic table and we see that it has a mass of 12.01 grams of carbon. And we know from our balanced equation that for every two moles of carbon that get used up, we use up one mole of oxygen, and let's check. Grams of carbon cancel, moles of carbon cancel, and we're left over with our moles of oxygen, which is 0 0.188 moles of oxygen. So now we have the number of moles of oxygen, 0 0.188 moles. We have our um, pressure which is equal to 810 millimeters of mercury. I'm gonna go ahead and convert that into atmospheres, and I get 1.07 atmospheres. And finally, I have my temperature, which is 48 degrees Celsius. If I convert that into Kelvin, it's 321 Kelvin. Now that I have the number of moles, the pressure and the temperature, I can solve for volume using PV is equal to NRT, the ideal gas law. I'll rearrange that to volume is equal to nRT over P and plug in my numbers. So my N is 0 0.188 moles of oxygen. My gas constant is 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Then I'm gonna multiply that by the temperature, which is 321 Kelvin. And I divide all that by my pressure, which is 1.07 atmospheres. Let's check our units. Atmospheres cancel as do Kelvin and moles and we're left over with our volume. 
and we get that our volume is equal to 4.63 liters. Answer is E. Question 20, a spacecraft is filled with 0.5 atmospheres of oxygen and 0.5 atmospheres of helium. If there's a very small hole in the side of this craft, such that gas is lost slowly into outer space, um, and then we have a variety of answers. Oxygen is lost faster, eight times faster. Helium is lost twice as fast, so on and so forth. And so the law that we're going to use to solve this problem is Graham's law. Graham's, Graham's law, which states that the rate of diffusion of a gas is inversely related to the square root of its molar mass. And so when we have a gas, so we'll put velocity of one over velocity of two, the rate of diffusion of 1 versus 2 is going to be inversely proportional to the square roots of their masses. So we'll put the mass of 2 over the mass of 1 like this. And so if I plug some um, gases in here, if I say the velocity of the helium, how much faster or slower will that be compared to the oxygen? And then I plug in the mass of the oxygen over here and the mass of the helium down here. Well, I know the mass of oxygen is... 32 grams per mole and the mass of helium is around 4 grams per mole. And so I could plug those numbers in and I would say that the velocity of helium over the velocity of oxygen is equal to the square root of 32 over 4, which gives you 2.8. So that tells us that helium, which is the lighter of the two gases, is going to diffuse through the hole in the side of this spacecraft 2.8 times faster than the oxygen. Thus the answer will be E, helium is lost 2.8 times faster than the oxygen is lost.